Uh, good morning, everyone. Thanks for joining us for Smart Water Wednesdays with Ben and Ben. Uh, I have with me my co-host, Ben Slick. I'm not. I, he's the good looking. <laughs> then you were in a lot of trouble this morning. We also have uh, our topic of the day is a day in the life of a water manager. And we have a great special guest with us, Andrew Chase from Monarch. Uh, Want to introduce yourself for the crowd, Andrew? Uh, Andrew Chase. I'm a, my current title is a resource management consultant for Monarch Environmental in lovely Orange County, California. Um, basically, go out there and monitor the irrigation systems and consult on systems, whether they're older or new, and do some project management and make sure that they're working to their peak, peak uh, performance. I love it. Uh, and tell us just a little bit about your background in irrigation. How long you been doing this? Uh, so irrigation wise, I've been doing it for 24 years. Uh, I started off with a distributor and I, I worked uh, uh, for a, a national distributor in, in Northern California and Southern Arizona for 14 years. And then uh, uh, the, the recession allowed me to, to go become uh, on the contracting side and, and work outside and you know, it, 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 it was a blessing in disguise because it really opened my eyes to the industry and just re, it just invigorated my passion towards uh, proper irrigation methods. And uh, I took every educational opportunity I can to, to get to where we are today. That's great. And uh, the reason that I thought that Andrew would be a great guest in this particular topic is that Andrew and Monarch are providing uh, what I consider to be next level water management services, right? Across the country, we talk about how water management is, you know, we're helping with water management using smart controllers and all the technology that WeatherTrack provides. But in Southern California specifically, we see um, restrictions that are far beyond anything else I'm seeing anywhere in the nation. And so Andrew is in charge of managing these systems more tightly than most water managers are asked to do. So I thought it would be really interesting to have him on and have him walk us through the experience of not only managing the technology and the irrigation systems, but the projects as well as all of the exterior components of a project, right? The customers and the subcontractors and all those little ways that um, WeatherTrack can help save steps in the field. I thought it would be good for our listeners to hear that. Um, so let's get started. I, I also promise that we will get some demos um, in. We'll see the technology today. You'll get some tips and tricks from Andrew. He promised he would do some click through stuff for us. Woohoo! Woohoo! <laughs> so turn him loose! Yeah. Turn him loose! Yeah. Let's start yeah. by telling, telling everybody how many WeatherTracks <clears throat> do you manage today? How many? Uh, do you controllers do you have in your account? So in my account currently, I have about 330 controllers that I, over, I oversee as far as uh, consult on, on an as wanted, you know, as a requested basis. And then of those, I physically manage on a daily basis about 80 to 85 of them. So that's every day going in, checking alarm, <clears throat> checking alerts. Uh, verifying flows, doing doing what we promote as proactive water management. So um, that's that's a growing number. So, but that's that's where we're at right now. So, um, in this in this concept of a day in the life, uh, it, where is your first interaction with WeatherTrack in the day? So my first my first interaction is I sit down in my office with my cup of coffee to wake my brain, and I turn it on. And I go into into the home page, and and the first thing I do is I type in the sites that I'm physically responsible for. So um, I use the, the the great method of using the sort. You go in, and I type in I type in one one of my accounts name is Bear Brand. So I type in Bear, boom, brings it all up, and I can see all you know. Yeah, I might get alerts throughout the night, but it just brings up that single account, and I can see everything that's gone on in the last. 12 to 14 hours of irrigation and I can go in there check and see why my high flow alerts my low flow alerts my mainline breaks my no flow alerts um, and I can break it down it's really nice to be able to break it down by site and just 
just concentrate on one, one of those sites. And so I go through site by site and I take a look at everything and I make my notes. If, um, if there, so as a consultant, we work with landscape contractors in a partnership. So we are hired, hired by the association or the property owner to go in and, and manage the water. And we truly build the relationship with the existing landscape contractor. You know, we're not there to take their job. We're only there to help augment what they do. So where they might be only be able to bring a tech to a certain area once every two to three months on a large, large community, I'm looking at it daily. So if there's a mainline break or a, 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 an issue um, that they're not going to see for a while, you know, it, it's valuable for our community and it's valuable for our partnership to say, hey, you know, we have this major problem. Um, for example, last week, or no, two weeks ago, I had an issue where I had a community and a no-flow alert came up. And I'm like, okay, you know, I'll check it out. Almost every, every single station that came up that day was on there. And it's like, okay, well, who shut off the water? That's the first thing you think of is who shut off the water. There's no way there's a no-flow alert going on for shutting off the water. So, you know, I, so I send, I send the email that came to my email. I forward that to the account manager and I said, Hey, I'm going to be going there today. This is a major issue because all of these went on, uh, alerted. So I'm going to show up today and take a peek and see what's going on. If you want to join me and they come back, well, we're busy. Just let us know. I'm like, okay, great. And it turns out that the common wire was disconnected from the master valve. Oops. Now, how does that happen? You know, someone, you know, so, but, but without having a flow sensor on there and, you know, I'm like, okay, well, why didn't I get, get a master valve alert? And then, so there was, there was some tricky stuff going on in there. Somebody played with something where they were able to, to bypass the alert, but it's still with the flow sensor, we were able to see that nothing turned on for the day. And so we got it worked out and I called them up and I said, Hey, if you can bring your tech over here to go through the stations, make sure everything works right. Because we have someone playing with the system. And, and this isn't the first time, you know, before it was just individual stations. Well, this time it was a master valve that they kind of played with. So, you know, it's like, Hey, but that's the, that's what we do. You know, my, my beginning of the day is just going through all the alerts to, to, to start the, the detective process of what's going on. Yeah, so when we train on that, the the idea is the we call that the alerts and operations dashboard, right? And the idea is that we give you those tools right in front of your face to eliminate the noise and highlight the potential issues that need to to be managed. Right. Um, what percent then, of the controllers that you manage have flow sensing? Uh, the ones that I personally manage. Um, I think I have about 60 to 70% with flow sensors on them, which is, which is a pretty good number. Uh, we really advocate for flow sensing on every single controller, especially if you have something that's able to use that technology. Um, you know, we, that, and that's part of our package is, is, you know, a lot of the times we come on a site and they've turned the flow sensors off because they, they, they you know, all of a sudden they're going out of whack. Yeah. That flow sensor is such a valuable tool um, with, with controllers. We, we, re we recently had a site retrofit from uh, uh, standalone controllers to, to weather track controllers, both LC pluses and, and pro threes. And they were trying to figure out why they kept getting mainland breaks. Yeah. Well, with, with adding the flow and finally getting everything set up, it took, it, it was a process, but we finally got it all set up and I run my learn flow, and there's my first cue. The system that was designed to run at 55 gallons a minute has yeah. slope zones at the top of the slope with a pump running 70, 80, 90 gallons a minute. And it's like, oh my goodness, what are you guys doing up here? Right. So we got a question for you on this topic. Um, uh, audience member would like to know, do you prefer normally open or normally closed master bell architecture and why? So my, my, my preference, and it, it comes back to the, to the type of system is there. I do prefer normally open over normally closed. Um, I do uh, appreciate having a uh, quick coupler access, um, having access to the water at all times. Uh, 
but generally on an older system, something that's been installed 20 or more year, uh, years, if it's a retrofit situation, I will recommend a normally closed system. And then to use, um, you know, with the app, you can, you can open up the, the master valve uh, when, when necessary, just because sometimes on a new system, it's easy to design everything right and, and to have it, you know, to ask for it to be installed right and, and hopefully they'll receive that it goes in right. On an older system, I've seen so many systems where the glue joints aren't glued right. Uh, I mean, I, I have an example, you know, here's my example of a glue joint that failed, you know, four inch main line where it was all glued together and the runs were too long and they just hammer every time. And on a system like that, if I left it normally open all the time, I'm still gonna have, you know, I might have little eight, nine gallon minute leaks that aren't gonna get caught with, uh, with uh, you know, the extended leak protection, on a, especially on a four inch main. So that's where I, I, I say, okay, look, we're going to do normally closed. Okay. But if it's a new system and we can, we can, we can uh, oversee the installation, I, I prefer normally open. All right. And on that same subject, do you have a type of flow sensor that you prefer to sell? Um, I prefer the ultrasonic. So, yeah, you know, the flow HD um, is my, is my new preferred, uh, preferred method, especially here in California and Southern California, where we have so many drip conversions going in now. So on a, on a two inch or three inch main, being able to see those really, really low flows, or even where they're retrofitting in a rotary nozzle. So they're going from spray zones that, that were 25 gallons a minute down to six or seven. Um, having the ability to be, see, be able to see that really low flow and that really high flow at the same time. Uh, it, it, it truly does make a difference. Plus with our reclaimed water, um, it doesn't gum up the impeller like, like, uh, right. like it used to, you know, you just clean off the, clean off the sensor and, and move on to the worst case scenario. So a couple, really a couple more questions for you on this topic. One is, um, you prefer plastic or iron on the flow HD? Uh, I prefer plastic. Okay. And then another question came in, what, what's the biggest difference uh, between being a contractor now and your new role as a consultant with Monarch? My, my, my biggest difference um, is, is now as a consultant, I can be a true advocate for everyone. Um, as a contractor, I felt like I had to play kind of a politics game where um, I, could, I could come in and I could see wh what another contractor was doing and think it was great. And I, I, you know, I'd say, yeah, they're doing a really good job, but I had, a, I felt like I always had to kind of bite my tongue one way or another. As, as a consultant now, I can come in and pretty much lay it out there one way or another without fear of repercussion because I've been hired in as the subject matter expert. I'm the person that's, that's being asked what's truly going on. And I, and I feel it's less political and more beneficial for the end user and for the contractor. Um, I'm more than willing to, to walk a site with everybody to explain what I see and educate. And a lot of times when, if you're working for a, a contractor and you, you're working alongside someone else, there's trade secrets and, and, and uh, the, the, like I said, the whole political game that, you know, you don't want to help them out too much, you know, just that you, you might help them out just enough to let them get by, but you don't want them to, 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 be the same or above you because you're going after that job and you're going after that work. Right. So, In addition, I would imagine that um, as a contractor, I always felt like the customer was seeing me as somebody trying to sell them something, right? right. Where uh, as a great water manager in today's day and age, we've got all these great technology solutions. And if you don't know what you're talking about, it can sound like snake oil. Exactly. But as a consultant, it, you can step in and help them advance the ball and, and really provide that sort of transparency for the customer and not let them feel safe and secure that they're making a good investment. Yeah, and that, that exactly, you know, last night I, when I was uh, on a call to, to do a, a Pro 2 to Pro 3 upgrade, I came in as, as an independent expert and I said, look, this, you guys really want to do the upgrade. And, you know, you don't want to let this fall by the wayside and just have it as a standalone controller. And the board member actually recognized, yes, you're not in somebody's back pocket. You're not in it for yourself. You're just telling us how it is. And it's true. So I can allow my passion to come through 
without making it seem like I'm going for that extra dollar, you know, and padding the profits of a company. I'm coming in right. and telling you how, how I truly feel about something and it's real and genuine and you can take my word for it that it's, that's, you know, that's what I see. So Ben, we're coming up on the midway point here. Should we give control to our guest and let him show us some stuff? Uh, it was exactly what I was thinking. Andrew, are you comfortable taking over and showing us some of the demos that you had in mind? Uh, sure. Yeah, I can, I can do that. So do you have the uh, share screen button? Yeah. Let's see here. Desktop Chrome. See here. Let me. Uh, doo -doo 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 -doo. Hopefully, this is it's every week. They're used to me doing that. So. <laughs> yeah, we didn't. We didn't go over this part, but. Um, mm -hmm. My computer is. Uh, On the computer. bottom of the screen, you have an icon that says "Share Screen." Yeah, my my. Um, it's not doing it yet. So Ben, why don't you take control? You want me to do it? Yep. Yeah, yeah, why don't you do it? I, mine is you got it. No my problem. my security settings are not allowing me to do it. Okay. Well let's go. It. So I, I apologize. Don't worry, we're fine. Um so we'll log in here to weathertrack.net. Uh again, your own username and password gains access to your account, which has all of the controllers that you've been authorized to view and to manage. We see first here the alerts and operations dashboard that we were talking about. Anything yeah. that you want to highlight here? Yeah, so, you know, that, that's what I was talking about is, you know, with all of my accounts, you know, I'll scroll down to this major alert screen and I'll type in, you know, under account, whatever account, you know, the, that I want to look at for the morning first thing. So generally I go alphabetically because that's how my brain works. And, uh, you know, I'll just say, okay, well, you know, I have corporate demo and then I could see, you could, you know, I'll say, okay, mainline break let me go take a look what what broke last night um what's you know what station number does it think it was on or what time was it at um so i'll go through i'll go through this uh name by name and i'll make my notes and i'll fire off my emails to account managers for you know if it's something minor like a uh, valve no connect that showed up in the middle of the night you know i'll just send that to an account manager mainline break um, something like I was talking about before where it was a no flow for an entire run for the night with 20 stations. That's where I'll make a note of where it was and what controller it was and, and investigate and, and, and schedule that to investigate it myself that day. Um, because to me, that's something pretty major. And for me to try to just email an account manager that I don't think they're going to get it. So I want to be as educated on the pro problem as, as possible. And Absolutely. So, so know, on the mainline break, Yep. Just one sec. Uh, one thing that I notice about advanced users versus kind of amateur or less experienced users is the use of these um, sorting features, the use of the quick, the quick access to that information, uh, either these the column sorts or the filters that help you find the right information ex exactly or as quickly as possible. And then the one click export tool, which makes it easy to communicate this stuff out. So if I wanted to export this to an Excel or PDF, that's how I would do that. Yeah. Um, and then another great feature with, with alerts, you know, and, and it kind of goes back to, uh, to clearing. So sometimes you get those low flow alerts and you go, okay, those are minor annoyances. But you know, if you, if you click on your, your controller to, to, to view your leak and you, you can look at you can look at a single controller, but then you can look at multiple controllers. So here, you know, at the top it says select controllers, one controller selected. If you take that drop down menu and now you can choose all the controllers you want to look at. You know, if I want to look at a site and I want to say, okay, I want to see all these controllers in one group and I want to clear all my low flow alerts for the day because they're just, you know, I'll, I'll, I'll take a look at them later on. Maybe, maybe they did some nozzling adjustments. Maybe there's, I need to relearn flow. Um, I'll go through there and I'll systematically click on all of the, all of the low flow, minor high flow, anything like that. I'll click through those and clear them all out at once. Instead of just doing one controller at a time and waiting, being having the ability to clear all those alerts all at once is really really awesome. 
So what we're talking about here is going through and just selecting the valve and flow alerts that you can clear, select those and then come up and push this clear flow and electrical alerts button and that will clear out any selected controller or selected yeah. alert. And, and especially with no connects, if, 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 if there's a no connect that comes on uh, or, or a short, if I want to verify that that short is truly there, I'll, 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 I'll try to make it happen again. And then if it does happen again, I know that it's a valid, it's a valid alert. Maybe it's not just something that, you know, a wet valve box did. I mean, it's going to be something that happens sporadically, but if so it's, do you have a trick to thing? run the valve test, do yeah. you have a trick to fig tell us your trick? Uh, the, the valve test. Yeah. To get the controller to run the valve test remotely. Um, do you want to know my trick? What's your trick? If I if you go in and change the master valve setting and save it, yeah. Whenever you change that master valve setting, as soon as the controller gets the change, it yeah. will run the valve test. Uh, so, okay, I've always just done added a station in the in the max stations. Um, uh, uh, another column. good trick. Same exact protocol. So and why then it, why uh, don't you it, show examples with that then? Click through to okay. So if I go, that would live here on the program page. Mike, go over. Oh, let's not use an OptiFlow controller. <laughs> let's use the Meadow View HOA that I always use. So if you want, if you're running diagnostics and you want to validate, you want the system to run a valve test. So you see up to the minute uh, electrical information. You just come on here and change your normally open master valve to normally closed and save that and then come back and change it back and save it as normally closed again but making that change will automatically prompt the controller to um, run the valve test so i come in here i just simply change that and hit save and send and that will as soon as the controller gets that that update it'll run the valve or it'll run the valve test to validate the condition of every valve yeah, like I said, I've used that max active stations. I'll, I'll, you know, yep. like here you're maxed out at 48, so I'd go to 47, send and save, and then put it back at 48, yep. and, and do the same call. thing. Yeah, no, and, and so you know. Ben, while you're here, rather than using a trick, what if we just turned runtime valve test on? Wouldn't that do the same thing? And then every time the irrigation started, it would chatter the every solenoid and bring you back a report of alerts. So what you're seeing here is just a demo controller because it's sitting in the corporate office and not attached to an irrigation system. I don't run that valve test. This defaults to on. So every controller in the field should have this on. Mm -hmm. um, I, I have it off because it's specifically set up as and, a demo. And my, my, you know, I had one recently where it ping, it came back as six, eight and 10. And so I wanted to verify that six, eight and 10 were truly bad. And so I did the max active stations and it came back eight cleared, but six and 10 stayed. And so it was one of the, I said, okay, well I have, so then I send this email to the, to the, you know, I forward that on to the account manager and I say, you have six and 10 that are truly not working out in the field now, but there's something up with eight also. So you might want to take a look, but you, you know, you may have a, a a common wire where the, uh, you know, where it's spliced into those three valves might not be working correctly or, or a junction somewhere. So something, something simple as a splice, but you know, then again, you might be having a valve box filling up with water and then all of a sudden it's just shorting everything out. Yeah. So Ben, we reviewed two ways to do a valve test. Are there other ways that a user can check to see if they have no connects or shorts? Um, those, th those are the control? steadfast ways. Those are the only two that I can think of right now that would prompt the valve test to run, just changing the valve configuration somehow, right? Yeah. Anytime that the system identifies that we've changed the valve setup, uh, it'll run that test to, to validate yeah. the setup that we just programmed in. And then, and then beyond all of the electrical, you know, with flows and everything like that, you know, once I get out into the field, you know, I'll drive my sites and I biggest thing I carry is a soil probe and I'll walk through, I'll drive through it and, and you, you might see a brown spot in the grass and I'm like, okay, I'm going to probe that real quick. And I drop my probe in and it sinks to the handle. 
you're like, what the heck? Why, how am I overwatering so much all of a sudden? So it's a great tool to be able to go in the app, you know, as long as the firmware has been upgraded enough, go in the app and turn it down or make a note to that area, turn on the system, see if you all of a sudden you have a, a you know, a head that might be just underneath the, the threshold to, to uh, not create a flow alert, or maybe it is a controller without a, without a flow sensor, you know, maybe you have a broken head in that area. I mean, I have a site where it, it was, um, uh, it's a full circle rotor that was stuck. So you see this big brown patch and you see this big tall, tall thatch of, of green and you're like, okay, there's nothing here. You turn on the system with the remote, all of a sudden you see this rotor just stuck right in the middle. You know, I was like, okay. And this was, you know, after a heat wave, it kind of started browning out. So it's really important for me to drive the sites minimum once a week, if not twice a week, just, just to catch that, those items as fast as possible. And the soil probe to me is, is, is number one. Um, a lot of people program these controllers in auto mode or in user ET mode, like, like Ron Popeil's Showtime Rotisserie. You know, you set it and you forget it. And nobody really takes the time to understand that these are dynamic systems, especially with flow. Um, you know, you have port, you know, nozzles that wear out and they, they grow bigger over time. Or maybe, maybe an irrigation tech only had number five nozzles for his rotor that day. And that's what he put in uh, doing nozzle adjustments. And I, I go into these controllers all the time that, that they haven't learned flow since 2015. And who knows what's going on there now. And, and the, it's an inch and a half main line with the, with the, with a setting at hundred gallons a minute. And so physically being proactive and walking these sites and managing these sites and visually spot checking systems is so important, you know, and, and the weather track app makes that easy. Uh, but at the same time, going in and being able to make adjustments to the controller on the fly is, is such a such a beautiful thing. And that's one of the great items about the, you know, I use that advanced auto as much as I can. I probably have 80% or more of my stations in auto and I make all my adjustments that way. Yes, there are going to be times to use user ET or user no ET for uh, new plantings or, or items such as that. And there are times when the contractor is going to ask me, hey, can I take control of this while we do some work here? Absolutely. Just, you know, it's that communication and that, like I said, that relationship before. Uh, but don't think I'm not going to drive by once or twice a week to make sure that it's, you know, doing, <laughs> doing what it's verify. supposed to do. You know? you know, when all of a sudden I see a full circle rotor zone set as spray heads, it's going to, you know, kind of go, um, no, you guys bumped it the wrong way. <laughs> All right. So while I have you, I want you to, to demonstrate some of these other great features that not all of our customers are using. Uh, uh, we talked yesterday about um, the mapping or the budget monitoring. Do you care which one you want to show off? Um, so so the, um, one, of the, one of the great tools I like to use also, um, it goes into the, uh, asset, the, the meters and the asset manager. Um, I don't know if you have any with water meters programmed on site. Oh, sure. That's a manager. Let me... One of the, one of what in here in Southern California, we touched on it in, in the beginning is that we have water budgets that we have to adhere to. Uh, we have our less restrictive locales and we're not talk, just talking tier one, tier two rates. We're talking tier three, tier four, but we get assigned a monthly water budget, not based on off of historical usage, but based off of actual weather taking, taken from ET reporting sites. Um, we have one water district in particular that is weekly. It gives you a weekly water budget. So, so when I'm talking about na nation leading water restrictions, this is exactly what I'm talking about. These type of mandated management restrictions that are done in real time and not based on hypothetical numbers, but actual measured values is something that I only see in Southern California. Yeah. So a lot of, you know, a lot of our companies that we work with, especially with the one that's weekly, they'll go out there and do weekly meter readings. They will physically go out there, pull the lids on Monday morning and take a meter reading. Now, if we find that there's a meter that is all of a sudden jumped up, um, and, and we think that it's okay within the parameters of, of flow. We don't have any mainline breaks, but all of a sudden it's jumped up. We'll take a look at it um, 
and being able to go into the asset manager and seeing the water meter number right there in the screen and say, okay, well that water meter is assigned to controller, you know, so here you go. See that, so that you have that water meter. Now you, you have that, usually you should have that water meter assigned to a controller and you click on that controller and you look and you download your 30 day history, you download a report, you look for anything unusual about that controller. But at the same time, if we're, if we're all of a sudden looking to go over budget, we can look at our highest using uh, stations. Maybe we have five turf zones that were bumped up 20% because they threw down some fertilizer or they, you could sit there and adjust the controllers on the fly to make sure that we, we stay within budget. And that having, having that is one of the biggest tools that I love to use because it just allows me to quickly and in easily go to my controllers, find my controller that's on that meter and say, okay, here we go. Let's, let's take care of this right now. Uh, so I, I, I love that. I love that feature and I use it a lot more than probably most people do. Um, I advocate people for putting it into their budget monitor. Um, I wish I did it more, but it's a, it's a great tool to use for your budget monitor. It, it helps tremendously with, with seeing in real time what, what's going on. And, and with our water budgets, you know, this year we had a crazy first four months of the year, you know, January and February were, were just, you know, dry, hot, you know, it's total out of, totally out of character. And then March and April, we had 400% of normal rainfall. I mean, it's literally like they flip flop. And so a lot of people go back to that historical usage and say, hey, you know, you, you, you're overwatering in January and February, but we, had, we, 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 we did really awesome in March and April. I'm like, well, yeah, look at the weather. And so being able to have a budget and actually see what's going on with, with the weather and, and communicating that in, 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 with our, with our uh, landscape contractors and with our communities is, is, is important. And in being able to track that with the budgets and with the weather, that's, that's that next level proactive approach that we talk about. And when we, cause we want to water, not only for saving water, but we want to do what's optimum for plant health and, and absolutely and, and keeping the aesthetic value of the community to keep their property values high and, totally. and, and, and making a, for, right? a mutually beneficial relationship. So our contractor we work with looks good. The community looks good. We look good. And it's a win, win, win situation. Absolutely. And, and coffee, so, our time is oh, up. Yep. I would, uh, do it. Andrew, we've got 10 seconds for you to answer the weekly question. What does weather track save you? What it saves me headaches. Saves you headaches. It saves me headaches. How does it um, save you headaches? Because, you know, I get excited about irrigation and, and I get excited when I get a weather track system in my hands because I know that I have one of the most flexible systems in the industry today. And so when I have a weather track system, I know that instead of running a controller for 15 minutes a day, three days a week, I can make it flexible and I can program every single station to its exact needs. And, uh, you know, I got one, one in shade, one in sun. Okay, they're going to be watered exactly the same. Uh, or, you know, not, not exactly the same, but they're going to be watered to their needs. So maybe one runs twice a week and one runs three times a week. It, it, it makes irrigating so much better because you're not dealing with going back and, and, and adjusting and adjusting and adjusting and, and it just makes my life easier. And Sounds like a <laughs> headache saved to me. That's awesome. Uh, all right. Thank you so much, Andrew. We Oh, look at this. I didn't even show the opening slides. Uh, <laughs> we are, as usual, here to support you. Check out our resources. Uh, if you're in the field, call our customer support team. They can help you. If you're training, we've got online materials and training material. Uh, so check us out. And um, we are looking forward to next week where we will have a conversation about rain pause and rain share. Kind of what does weather, how does weather track manage rain? Um, and what can you expect out of your weather track systems during rainfall? And we're going to have a great guest from Mid America Apartments. Um, Alex Klinker is the regional landscape director for Mid America Apartments and is a great weather track user. So excited to have 
that going on next week. So please check us out. We are happy you're here this week. And uh, my name is Ben Coffey. Happy to have you here. Thank you for uh, tuning in and we'll see you next week. Mr. Slick. Thank you, everybody. Appreciate you as always. And Andrew, special thanks to you for taking time this morning. Thanks. Thank you, Ben. Thank you, Ben. It's been great. Thanks, Andrew. Have a great day. You too. See you, everybody.